Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar of this afternoon uh, in the series around Lisbon. My name is Lisa Buck Anderson. Um, I'm the Director of Communication and Congresses for Attico ITS Europe, and I am delighted to be your host um, for the webinar today. Um, so let me briefly share the agenda. Um, as you know, we are in every webinar up to the Congress focusing on some of the key themes uh, of the Congress, and today is no exception. Uh, we're focusing on freight and logistics and data value chain. Um, in a moment, I will hand over to my CEO Attico, uh, of Attico, Joost van Tommer, who will give his welcome. And then I will give a quick update on the Congress, uh, which is just 10 days away. And then I hand over uh, to my colleague, uh, Nikos uh, Tampieris, who is senior manager at Attico, and he will moderate a panel uh, with a number of fantastic speakers who each of them are experts in their field. Uh, and so I look very much forward to that panel that will illuminate uh, different angles from both of the topics that we're covering today. And as you can see um, from this uh, word cloud, there are indeed many, many different facets that one could talk about, from greening of freight and logistic chains to last mile deliveries to truck platooning to paperless vehicle and load tracking, to data value chains, to the role of big data, digitalization, data analytics, et cetera, et cetera. And what we don't cover today, you will also find the opportunity to hear about at the actual Congress. So if we move forward, a couple of house rules, um, you are all in listen only mode. Uh, but throughout the um, webinar, you can ask your questions either in the tool that is up on your top navigation bar, Q&A, or um, if you prefer on the email congress pr at mail.article.com, and you can do that throughout the call. We will be recording this webinar and we'll be sharing it through our channels. And with that, uh, once again, welcome from my side. And I would now like to hand over to my CEO, Joost van Tommel. Please, Joost. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Uh, thank you for joining us so numerously. This is a crucial topic. Um, freight, logistics, moving of goods from point A to point B is indeed one of the big focus areas more and more from, um, from warehousing to, I would say, last mile delivery. Um, this is indeed a unique setting that we will have at the Congress. So thank you all for being here, my partners, my friends of the logistics and freight area. As you know, Ertico is a public-private par public partnership, uh, 125 members um, actually doing transport and logistics, but much more. It's about smart, clean, safe and efficiency, not only Europe, but EMEA. Next slide, please. Um, what is interesting is that all what you do in this um, in this area is actually linked with other, uh, we call it connecting the dots, so connecting the things together, gluing the system. It is a truck connected to a cargo container, to a ship, he needs an e-freight document, um, and all these kind of things we nicely combine in our article family with the help and support of a lot of institutions like the European Commission, TG Move, Glo Connect and RTD. Um, on the next slide, you will see then why the Congress is important for us. It is actually your Congress. It is a Congress to meet and greet people, not a Teams meeting like today, but actually tangibly, physically see each other, but also see things in action. We are there to bring innovation in transport and logistics. We are there to bring new technologies in your area and actually to help and accommodate the whole policy area, such as the smart and sustainable mobility strategy, data strategy, dematerialization of documents, customs union, etc., etc. I think it can go on and on for a day. Um, I'd like to see you there, all of you, uh, for the exhibition, the demonstrations, and looking forward to this webinar. Thank you. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Joost, for this great introduction and welcome. 
so let me continue with a short update of the Congress, which is only 10 days away. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing everyone there. Um, indeed, the Congress is, is very comprehensive. Um, we have a super strong high level program ready for you, uh, as well as a technical program with over 100 sessions. And just to give you an idea, um, we have around five to 600 speakers in total across the high level program and the technical program. So there are a lot of experts who are making their way uh, to Lisbon across the family that Joost was talking about, all the different industry work uh, verticals that are important uh, to drive mobility and ITS forward. We have a exhibition as well and a demonstration um, and indeed, we are connecting the dots. If we look at uh, the next slide here, you see uh, a, um, a short overview of some of the speakers in the high level program. Uh, you can go on the website and see more details and also have their background. Um, but you will see they are really from across uh, EMEA and really from across very different public and private uh, sectors uh, representing the ecosystem uh, that drives us forward. As I mentioned before, both of the topics, freight and logistics and also data value chain, are very, very prominent um, in the Congress. You can see here actually um, different elements of each of them will be part of the four plenaries that we have highlighted here for you. But also in the technical program, um, there are a number of elements that are key, not least um, 25 special interest sessions. And also we had close to 40 technical papers in total uh, about these two topics. So stay tuned, you will learn more. Uh, when you join us in Lisbon. And talking about joining us in Lisbon, um, don't forget the uh, registrations. Uh, there is a special offer actually on the 16th and 17th of May um, for uh, those of you that follow us on the Congress newsletter. Um, but for all of you, uh, remember to register as soon as possible to join us. The app, very important. Those of you who have followed us for a number of years know that we have a very comprehensive app where you can start building up your program. Um, some of you uh, forget that you have to register before you get access to this app with the full information. So another reason to register so that you can start planning your time. You can also scan it here and you will get the slides uh, afterwards. Sorry, uh, there is a, a little QR code here um, to help you along the way. If we move on, indeed, here is a snapshot of the fabulous list of sponsors that we have for Lisbon. And as you can see here, rolling slides uh, throughout the next two, three slides. We also have an outstanding list of exhibitors and we're happy to uh, share that the exhibition space is really fully sold out. And once you have worked very hard through each of the long full days with so many different opportunities, we also make sure to have a bit of fun. Uh, we have on the day two, the gala dinner in Sud Lisboa. Uh, which is an absolute stunning venue. Um, and we look forward to see you there. As I often share, normally uh, we are really hundreds of people that gather and celebrate together. And in case you don't feel up to date or you missed some of the channels uh, that the marketing and communications team uh, are pulling together, you have the list here with direct links. So please join the conversation on social media as we near the actual Congress. And with that, uh, I would like to hand over to my lovely colleague Nikos, who will be moderating the panel going forward. Thank you very much.
Thank you, dear listener. Uh, freight and logistics sector undergoes a radical transformation, as we see from the digitalization of logistic chains. There is a shift from paper to data management, which will be widely adopted in a EU-wide digitalized freight and logistics sector. Silos will be ultimately eliminated and goods will be transported in seamless multimodal ways from point A to point B based on digital solutions services. Freight and logistics, of course, benefits from the interconnected world we live in as it draws innovations from other technology areas, 5G and Internet of Things, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud computing are key enablers to mention but a few. And with this increasing use of technology in the sector, data has become, of course, a valuable asset and data value chain plays a critical role in the sector's success. Of course, we at Ertico monitor and actively participate in these developments through initiatives and projects which aim to increase interoperability and connectivity in the optimization of cargo flows and facilitate agile supply chain management. So please allow me to refer to four projects, Phoenix, Storm, 5G Meta and Prep this space for mobility, in which Ertico and Ertico partners and of course our speakers are involved and this projects serve as prime examples of the revolutionary developments we witness in the field. Phoenix is the first European federated network of platforms for B2B and B2A data exchange and sharing, offers interoperability between any individual existing and future platforms. When we go to Storm, Storm explores novel concepts for freight and logistics, business models, innovative solutions based on zero emission vehicles. 5G Meta, a platform to connect multiple key players, is designed to operate as a common infrastructure for implementing, implementing data pipelines to cater for heterogeneous applications in the area of connected cooperative automated mobility. Finally, Prep this space for mobility, a preparatory action for the upcoming European mobility data space, contributes to the development of this, maps existing data ecosystems, identifies gaps and overlaps within, and proposes common building blocks and governance frameworks. Only yesterday, dear friends, we had a fantastic workshop with a very large participation where we brought together SICAM, Clean and Sustainable Urban and Logistics Mobility Communities, stakeholders together, as I said, to share their needs and requirements in the field of ITS and to support the development of the upcoming common European mobility data space. And having said all this, it's about high time to introduce our five speakers, the fantastic five, as uh, my colleague uh, Lisa mentioned in uh, her presentation, and I share this view. I have uh, the luck and the honor to work with all of them in the projects I mentioned just right now. Before going to the introduction of our speakers, I would like to, to inform the audience that there will be a, a Q&A session in the end. If they want to put forward any questions that they might arise after our colleagues will present, they may put them in the chat and our speakers will try their best to answer them. So without further ado, uh, let me please introduce uh, Dr. Wasim Soman, a researcher at Chalmers University of Technology which will, uh, who will review the state of the art regarding the use of uh, big data to improve road freight transport. And needless to say, of course, that uh, DR Wasim is also playing a very critical role in the STORM project developments. Wasim, the floor is yours.
Wasim, sorry, you, you are muted. You. Wasim, I think oh. you are muted. I'm sorry, I was <laughs> I was talking <laughs> while I was muted. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Nico, for this introduction. Very, very lovely introduction, and uh, was really it was really a pleasure working with you and others in uh, in our project. Uh, so uh, to start, uh, my name is Wasim. I'm, uh, I'm a researcher at Chalmers University of Technology. I worked uh, at this project together with uh, three other universities. Uh, uh, together, we. Uh, we reviewed uh, literature. We had we put our experience together to uh, review the the use of big data in the road freight sector, and we kept up with uh, many reports and publications. And here I'm gonna be summarizing them in this uh, presentation. So uh, first, I'm gonna be talking about uh, why do we need big data and road freight uh, applications. Uh, needless to say, that we have many many problems in this sector. Um, and we're trying to uh, solve the these problems by investing in discovering the new patterns and heterogeneity between the users of this sector. And big data can help with uh, doing that. Uh, so the structure of the freight sector itself is becoming more complex and rap rapidly evolving, which requires a lot of uh, different uh, in in uh, innovation and technologies to be used in this sector. Uh, big data can facilitate that. And uh, an example of these um, solutions with big data is an, is an application that we're trying or we're working at right now at some project where we're trying to allocate infrastructure for the new uh, green uh, infrastructure uh, for the new green uh, vehicles, such as the electric vehicles, the, hyd the hydrogen vehicles. And to do that, there are new and new vehicles are on the road. They have limitations. Uh, earlier models cannot find these uh, limitations and predict properly the right infrastructure for that. So help, big data can help us uh, overcome these problems and find solutions. Next slide. So first, uh, we need to distinguish between big data as a, as a data itself and big data analytics. Big data can be described as a label to data, which distinguishes it by um, vo the volume, the five Bs, the volume, the velocity, the variety, the veracity, and the value of the data itself. So it's a label for the data. But when we change or we convert this big data or data into knowledge, that is the big data analytics. And we don't have time to go to all the types or the categories of the applications that we can implement with these uh, analytics. But to give you an overview of them, we have three types of analytics, big data analytics. We have the first one is the descriptive analytics, where we try to answer questions of what has happened and what is happening and now, uh, right now and why is that happening? So we are discovering patterns with the first uh, category. The second category is the predictive analytics. Now, this uh, answers a different question of what will be happening or what's likely to happen. And that's very useful with big data and statistics or machine learning to try to attempt or predict the future. And the last uh, category is the perspective. Uh, and a uh, category, it's a combination of the previous two ones where we try to answer what should be happen or how we can influence that. So it is a, a tool to help uh, policymakers make the right decision. Next. Uh, Next, so uh, big data in the freight, freight sector comes from uh, a lot of sources, and we uh, identify them or categorize, categorize them into five main categories based on how we collect them or how the data is collected. So we have the first one is the road mounted sensors. It's not uh, really a new uh, data source. It has always been used, but with big data, it's become more, uh, more useful. Uh, we have vehicle tracking devices that comes from GPS measurements, for example. We have the analog devices, we have the reported multimedia data, and we have the communication devices. Uh, next. Yeah, and with big data, there are many, many challenges, and we put them into four um, broader uh, groups. The first one is the legal group, where we introduce a little bit or talk about how the laws here in the EU are a little bit uh, protective for the individual, so that can hinder somehow 
or can make challenges for the big data users. We have also the political problem where they expect more encouragement from them to uh, encourage the others to use big data or share big data with the others. We have an organizational problems at the organization level itself, where if we don't have the right technicians, the right data scientists and the right leaders, the, the benefits of big data disappears. And lastly, we have technical problems and we, we group them into two uh, less or smaller categories. One is uh, the preventable and the other is the external. We divide these technical problems uh, according to the organization itself handling the big data. So if the organization can uh, find these challenges and prevent them by making some kind of um, of a measure for that, then the, these are a preventable uh, challenge that could be done or can be overcome. And the other ones are the external group, which are a bunch of uh, challenges that the organization needs help from other organizations in order to overcome these problem, overcome these problems. Next. And uh, these problems or these challenges are connected to each other. So if, if some if one of the challenges is not handled very well, it could influence other problems or could make other problems appear uh, again. And these challenges are stem from the data itself and can also uh, stem from the data processing. So uh, Sometimes the challenges appear while you're processing the data and converting to, from one type or to another. So if you're not handling right, uh, correctly with the right technicians, then you'll have a lot of challenges. And these all challenges are discussed very well in our report. Uh, we don't have enough time to go into deep into each one of them, but there are also opportunities where we discuss that or discuss them. And, uh, there, there is a lot for uh, the researchers to contribute to uh, and for big data in the road freight sector. One is where they can support uh, research and new trends in the modeling of the infrastructure development. They can also expand the potential in data analytics and utilization. They can also achieve higher quality with, uh, with big data for their models or for their uh, data analytics. Uh, so in conclusion, I want to say that there are uh, many challenges that we face when using big data in the road freight sector, and they stem from the data itself or from converting this data into knowledge. Uh, and they could be grouped into four main categories. But and also we can say that there are uh, many data sources, and they differ according to how we collect this data, collect this big data, and each category. Uh, or each group has its own uh, sampling format, resolution, and information. And we need a bunch of these uh, groups together in order to uh, have a nice model or a nice application. But noticeably, the G GPS measurements are uh, one of the most used and most important data sources for uh, the, the, uh, the road freight sector professionals that they want to use or they want to develop good model. Uh, this, this data source should be now um, uh, studied very well, or should you should always have a, an expert who knows how to deal with this data at your institute if you want to do a good model. Uh, then, lastly, we have uh, we have a lot of opportunities with big data, and most of these opportunities comes from the big data able to uh, identify the heterogeneity of the activities of each user or each vehicle in the system. Uh, next, so uh, that's uh, that's for my presentation. Thank you for listening. If you want to read more about what I have said or what I have discussed, uh, please read this uh, reference here. Uh, you'll find much more useful information there. And if you have any more questions, please shoot. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, Asim, and for referencing uh, the big data within this uh, very interesting uh, uh, project, uh, the STORM project. Thank you so much. It's time now to proceed with our next uh, presenter, Barry Van Lumen, Luven, I'm sorry, Managing Director of Pioneera and uh, deeply involved in our Phoenix project. Barry? The floor is yours to deliver the, your presentation on digitalization and automatization for transport and logistics. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Nikos. Um, as Nikos said, uh, my name is Barry. I'm co-founder and general manager of Pioneer. And uh, we have a passion for dematerialization of the logistics. We started 15 years ago 
uh, aimed on the dematerialization, taking away of the documents in the logistics. Uh, it, and, and the adoption is very slow. So we, we created the data sharing platform with the generic solution for digit lining, uh, signing documents, any way of documents, uh, legal documents like CMR, uh, waste documents, and so on. Next, please. So what we created, because we are in a transition period, so we created the data, sh a data sharing platform that can be filled in on a manual way for the small communities and the small companies who doesn't have any IT inf environment, uh, even still in, in 23. But OK, small companies, to, uh, family companies, they can use the platform on a manual way, like we fill in documents online. Uh, for those who have uh, regular the same transport, they can use the templates on the website. And you see in the first manually and templates, it is only one way to uh, collect the data. We cannot send data back during the transport, so during uh, the, the possibility of the, the freight exchange, only in the integrated. So we are not a primary layer. That means that we build a community, a data sharing platform uh, built on existing platforms. That means that if companies have their own TMS transport management system, ERPs, warehouse management, whatever it is, they have their own uh, infrastructure they can use by using by uh, privilege the API or other possibilities to exchange data over our platform. And inside the data sharing platform, you can create your own community. So community who is sharing and uh, enrich data to create the official documents like an e-freight document, uh, ECMR, um, identification for waste, uh, soil, whatever it is, and can be used uh, by the different players, the different stakeholders and transports. Even additionally, we created an, a, an adoption of a digital archive and all those we will kept there for seven years at least. So that's the platform. This is the opportunity, the version about paper versus e-documents. The physical handling, and we see that even the adoption is very slow for dematerialization and logistics. We, we make a calculation and we see that we can reduce up to 75% of the administrative labor because you don't have physical uh, handling, uh, digital archive, readability, because in transport, we the, the biggest problem in, in logistics is um, language, language barriers, drivers of different... Uh, uh, origin are arriving in different countries. There are some issues about, uh, I'm coming for that order. You can solve it with a simple app, even integrated in the board computer. So the app, more than 50 different languages, the driver, the persons involved in logistics, they can handle documents and information on their own way, in their own language, even with attachments, pictures, there is transparency. And there is real time interaction with all the stakeholders, even they are uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, like Jos says in the beginning, even there is time frames and different time zones, you can handle information between the different stakeholders in your own language. And that makes transparency and clearance of the correctness of the official documents. Next, please. Further on, what's the difference between paper and electronic? Uh, version. If every step you take on an electronic one, you have the arrival times, you have plan times, you, uh, all kind of information, the status, the time frame, and even a geolocalization. What helps again for reducing the administrative labor, uh, the decarbonization, because all people can see, like you have in airports, in a dashboard, the information about your freight if the driver already there. Now at this moment, a lot of interactions needs to be done by telephone, by email, that kind of uh, unnecessary labor and interactions you can take away by digitalization. Even the next step, we're talking about self-driving trucks, self-driving cars, automating pickups, intelligent access, whatever it is, you can combine it with your information you get on your dig digital uh, document because the arrival times, the QR code, the AMPR camera can read the license plate of the truck and all those information, you can collect data, you can integrate and you can make it more sustainable for the future in your own organization. Next. 
even it's data sharing, it's data enrichment, and there is not only one platform, there are multiple uh, platforms in the world at this moment. But as a company, you can choose which company or which platform you prefer most. You can make a connection. You don't have to make different connections you have to do like today with EDI. You have to make EDI uh, connections with all the stakeholders you have in logistics. In the future, it will be not necessary because you work with data sharing platforms in the middle, the transport and logistic platform, who can communicate with each other uh, by sharing those information, those is important to create documents, to have information. Uh, what the previous speaker says, the big data. And a part of the big data you can use to communicate between the different stakeholders, uh, even for creation of the electronic documents. And there we have the Phoenix connector. Together with Phoenix, with uh, an enormous thank for the partners and the opportunity we have with Phoenix, we, we created in four, year time, in four years time, a Phoenix connector for the information sharing from uh, B2B to B2G to the government. Some countries, they, they need to have information and we can share it. I will talk in the next slides to it. And then we have the EFTI interoperability. Those are the both informations, the Phoenix connector and the EFTI uh, interoperability. Does, doesn't make care where you are, what you're doing, the waste producer, producer the truck, what kind of transport you, you use, multiple uh, intermodal transport, single modal transport. All those have just one connection to one of those platforms whose uh, exchange data and with the Phoenix connector, we can use the EFTA data sets that the authorities inside Europe, just with one app, and that's important to know that every data sharing platform for electronic documents, for example, needs to be have um, a permit with an EFTI regulation. That means that the authorities for checking around the road, just with one app, can see where the data come from and what are the legal documents. So they don't need to have uh, an, an, a unique connection to the different uh, marketplace holders in the market. So we have on the left upper corner uh, a screen, just an example for the app, can be used standalone on the app. Uh, you download in the app store, or you can integrate it in your own board computer or integrate it in the existing app you have. So again, it's not the part of us as a player in the market for be mandatory. We are not a mandatory, we are not a, a primary player. Uh, we are secondary. We use the existing uh, systems to connect our data. And then you have the possibility to sign that what you do with the bank app. You have your QR code, your unique code, uh, and those are the possibilities on a legal settlement that is on European based uh, regulation, how to sign up between shipper and transport company, between transport company and receiver of the goods. So all kinds of possibilities are involved in uh, taking count in it and the platform. Next, please. This is the end in a smart overview, in a nutshell, what are the possibilities of digitalization and dematerialization of uh, the moments in the market? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Barry. Always a pleasure to hear you. And thank you for sharing your uh, insights into VC documents as a service uh, for transport and logistics. It's time now for our next speaker, Lucy Kerstein, EU Project Coordinator, National Academy of Science and Engineering, ACATEC. And of course, uh, Lucy uh, is the soul behind the prep this space for mobility uh, support uh, action to the upcoming European mobility data space that I referenced earlier. Lucy, the floor is yours to deliver your presentation on logistics and freight transport in the European mobility data space. Yeah, thanks, Nikos, for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, glad to be here. Also, um, of course, uh, yeah, looking to to the ITS Congress, where we'll also be present and hoping to enter into a more direct dialogue with you. Um, 
here, of course, just a short uh, overview of, of what we're currently doing. And uh, Nikos has already is, yeah, hinted to some of the aspects that we're covering in this project. Um, so um, one of the things that we're currently doing, so um, yeah, maybe just a few words to introduce the project. It's uh, funded under the Digital Europe program um, by the European Commission. And uh, so in that sense, we're trying to support the Commission in their endeavor to um, implement their data strategy, but also um, in um, yeah, getting uh, um, a little bit uh, closer to um, the very long, uh, well, very distant goal of a EU single market for data in the mobility and logistics domains. There are other preparatory actions that look into um, setting up data spaces in other sectors like tourism, um, energy, um, green deal, and so on. But um, yeah, we're, we're focusing on the mobility vertical that includes both passenger mobility and logistics. Um, we have um, in the first part of our project uh, generated a catalog of these mobility and logistics data ecosystems because we wanted to find out what is out there in Europe and um, following up on, on these ecosystems with um, surveys to understand um, their components um, and, and also their governance and, and business models behind, because of course we wanted to understand how it's possible to, um, from these conclusions, um, build a European common data space. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, there's just a link to our inventory if you want to have a look. Um, um, it's going to be further refined, um, so uh, bear with us and, and check from time to time. Check also if your data ecosystem, if you happen to be involved in one, is, is uh, represented on that map and let us know in case it's not, because we really wanted to um, um, yeah, give the Commission and other interested people um, a comprehensive overview of that landscape in Europe. Um, you can see here that it's um, yeah, um, um, it's it's a it's an inventory classified by by transport mode, which allows you also to look at the different logistics initiatives, um, um, especially the ecosystems that already have gained some maturity. We have over 400 uh, ecosystems in our inventory, but only around 280 are listed on that website because of um, some criteria that we apply to it, uh, such as as I said, the maturity of the ecosystem and, and other criteria. Uh, next slide, please. And the other um, um, yeah, important part of our work is also to find common ground on the building blocks um, that we want to um, propose um, for building a, a common data space. And for that, it's very important for us to be engaged with the whole um, ecosystem of stakeholders in in uh, especially also in the in the logistics um, domain. So if you happen to work in that field on data exchange, um, we of course also want to hear from you. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think the 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 obvious link uh, between our initiative and um, the current. Yeah, current uh, situation in logistics is obviously that um, there are a large number of local um, data projects and, and you could say data islands or data silos being um, set up. And it's also, we discussed it yesterday um, uh, in depth that, uh, of course, uh, a lot of platforms uh, uh, have been also funded by by EU um, EU funding, and now uh, EU funding is trying to bind everything back together. Um, and we also see that yeah, a lot of um, proprietary systems or standards are used. Uh, lots of sensitive data is exchanged, which makes which makes of course the um, um, the data space concept um, a very attractive one. Um, um, because it allows stakeholders to share data without actually giving up their sovereignty. So um, this concept, um, yeah, um, of course, you can 
you can uh, dig a bit deeper. There are lots of resources out there, especially from the previous Open DEI project and from the Data Spaces Support Center, the DSSC. But um, just very shortly, um, so of course you can ensure that um, data can be held at the connector of the data owner and it's not pooled into common uh, repository. Um, um, you can also make sure that um, um, in the central catalog, you have um, basic discoverability of the data that could potentially be shared peer-to-peer -peer and info on access conditions. So it, it provides um, a low threshold um, yeah, access um, and um, that can be further explored. Um, we're also looking at the different access conditions and how you can digitally, of course, enforce it. Um, um, and the, um, the usage control policies that you can also implement in these connectors. So one of the connectors um, that is frequently used in these data spaces, the Eclipse, uh, are the Eclipse data space components, if you want to have a look at it. Um, this is something, for example, um, implemented currently by the mobility data space in Germany, by Katina X uh, and other other initiatives. Um, so we're currently looking at, at connectors such as this one to, to see if that could be uh, one um, opportunity uh, for also the European mobility data space. Then, um, um, for example, um, yeah, we, we also want to uh, create a more decentralized and yeah, federated network of, of uh, platforms that, um, yeah, where common rules and governance apply. And um, we see that, that this could lead to, to a federation of mobility and logistics platforms, which means that we could have a central, con uh, central catalog at the European level um, that provides much more visibility to the data that is present in the sector. Um, so um, yeah, and and here are some some reasons why this is particularly um, important at the moment um, because mobility and logistics, of course, are cross cross sector but also cross border in nature. Um, the European Commission wishes, of course, to um, yeah, ensure um, interoperability between geographical. Um, yeah, data space initiatives um, in different parts of Europe, but also cross-sector. Uh, I already talked about other data spaces being set up in tourism, smart industry and energy and so on. Um, and um, of course, um, there are also currently um, building block developments and deployment initiatives undertaken. So both in the development of reference architectures, um, you might uh, have heard of the International Data Space Association or Gaia-X initiatives, um, but also um, we're looking at uh, mobility data, data specific components that are being developed by many sector specific initiatives. And um, we see that there is convergence needed. This is the convergence that we want to provide with this project, um, at least um, um, in a preliminary fashion, so that we can um, yeah, look into the generic building blocks that hopefully can be harmonized across different sectoral data spaces, but also um, looking into um, yeah, um, um, agreeing on a set of uh, sector specific, so mobility and logistics specific building blocks that um, would be useful for that intra data space interoperability um, that we really need in, in, in the sector um, of mobility and logistics. Uh, so next slide. Um, this just to um, give you a glimpse at um, the framework that we use as a basis. So the Open DEI building block framework um, with the um, different categories um, or the taxonomy that, that divides these building blocks into interoperability, trust, data value and, and governance building blocks. Um, you can find more on that um, yeah, by Googling OpenDEI. It's uh, readily available also on the IDSA website, um, one of our partners in this project as well. Um, next slide. Uh, dear Lucy, uh, please let us speed up a bit uh, because time is very limited. Thank yeah. you. 
it's almost it's almost uh, we're almost uh, through so um this is just to give you a, um, a glimpse at the initial vision um, that the European Commission has. Um, you can look at the slides afterwards. I'm sure they are going to be provided. So um, seeing how the Commission intends to in the future um, come up with um, with the framework that, that links these different initiatives in the subsectors together. Next slide, please. And of course, we would like to have your participation also in the upcoming workshops and forums. So we have one, just one back, please. Um, so there is a, um, a workshop uh, on the 30th um, of May. So please save the date and, and let us know. Here's the, the email address, the generic project email address, but also you can contact me directly if you would like to hear about that. And also please subscribe to a newsletter if you want to hear um, about these events and, and really have your say in in the construction of this uh, the data space next slide and you can exactly so you can already show the full list so if you would like to provide inputs don't hesitate um, to contact me directly um, there are a few um, already a few aspects that I mentioned here where um, on, on which we want to have your feedback. Um, and, and of course, we're always open to, to have a bilateral informal exchange as well. So um, yeah, that's it from my side. Um, thanks Thank a you, lot. Thank you, Lucy. Seems you are running a marathon together with us to spread the good word about the PrEP this space for mobility and the European mobility data space. Next speaker, uh, just a, a kind request to the rest of the speakers. Uh, let us stick to the time limit. OK, so thank you. It's Dr. Gorka Veles is as and is going to deliver his presentation on exploiting 5G data platforms for innovative ITS, also a key member of 5G Meta project. Gorka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and I'll try to be quick so you can go next. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to present two different approaches of 5G platforms uh, that can facilitate the generation on innovative uh, ITX and logistics uh, services and applications. So the first approach comes from the 5G Meta pro uh, project. Here the focus is uh, on making infrastructure or vehicle data accessible to third parties. This is what uh, we call a data platform. And here the platform acts as a broker between data producers that in this case uh, will be the infrastructure, sensors, the vehicles, or any, any other kind of the device that uh, generates data and data consumers that in this case will be a third party application or service. And Fagiana, the approach is a bit different here. Instead of a data platform, the, the focus is more on a processing platform. So distributed processing with onboard processing also, and is based on network application. That is a concept that I will explain later. OK, in the 5G meta, there is no data storage inside the platform. And third parties are subscribed to data flows. So there is a continuous delivery of data. Uh, the platform includes functions for data management, data monetization, and cybersecurity, as well as providing data access mechanisms. The objective of the third parties is to monetize the data received from the 5G Meta platform. So if we look at the, this uh, picture, at the bottom we'll have data producers that could be any kind of infrastructure device that sends data to the platform through the MEC and the cloud, and then the third parties are uh, reading this data uh, from the cloud and offering a service. Uh, the 5G Meta platform will be open source at the end of the project, February 2024, but uh, I would like to present you an opportunity to try this uh, platform uh, right now. So if you go next. OK, so I would like to highlight that there will be a hackathon precisely in the ITS Congress. You are still on time to get registered, so if you are interested to try the, the platform, and um, uh, come with an innovative idea from the ITS or logistic uh, sectors or what of application or service that can be done on top of the platform. Uh, the winners will be awarded with a total of 6,500 euros and you can get registered 
at the 5G Meta web. At the end, uh, the last slide, I will show a QR so you can uh, uh, access the link. Okay, in the 5G ANA, uh, we are working with this concept of network uh, application. In case that you don't know, a network application is a virtual application that can be deployed in a 5G infrastructure, it can use 5G services, and can be composed of one or multiple application or network functions, uh, application function, other one functions that implement different logics. And an ITS or logistics vertical service can be composed by one or multiple uh, network applications. Next, please. Yeah. So what the uh, 5G ANA platform is offering you is access to, to develop, deploy and test your services, a catalog of already developed uh, application network functions and, and network applications, accessibility to OBU and ROSA units, so hardware resources and real and virtual vehicles, and gain visibility towards the European Union and the, and the 5G community. Okay, next. So here there is the opportunity of uh, joining this open call. The, the best performing experimenters uh, can get 15,000 euros. So you can go to the website and the deadline for this open call is um, uh, May 22, exactly the first day of the ATS Congress. So before going to the ATS Congress, if you are interested in this, please get registered to the, to the open call. And next. Then last but not least, from the 5 Giana uh, project, uh, we would like to invite you also to a questionnaire to give us feedback about the usefulness of the proposed uh, platform. It will take less than one minute, it's, it's very quick. It is the, the link I will show a QR in the next slide. So I would like to please uh, invite all the participants in this webinar to go to a questionnaire. So here is uh, the QR. Uh, scan it if you are interested in any of these activities. So the opportunities are in a wrap up the 5G Meta Hackathon and the ITS Congress. Uh, the ongoing Fagiana open call and the Fagiana feedback uh, questionnaire. In addition, uh, if you want more information about uh, what I have been presenting here, there will be a special session in the ITS Congress called New ITS Services and Application Enabled by 5G, the 24th of May at uh, 2 p.m. And in addition, um, I'm a senior researcher in Ficontec and my organization will have a booth in the ITS Congress, so you can come at the booth, uh, to the booth and you can discuss with us uh, uh, any of these topics. So thank you very much. This is everything from my side. Thank you for uh, to Artico for the invitation and see you at the Congress. Thank you, thank you, Gorka, and thank you for uh, touching up on the 5G data platforms, the, the use of 5G uh, in these platforms, 5G Meta and uh, Yaman. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jonathan Keller, research scientist from Fraunhofer, a very good friend and co-worker in STORM project. He is going to talk about high how climate change and digitalization are changing freight transport. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicolaus, and I'll uh, try to keep to around five minutes. <clears throat> so uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk today. Um, this really is taking a step backwards from the previous presentations, and I shall make a point about that at the end. Next slide, please. So what we have done in the STORM project was an initial activity looking through a literature review, um, surveys and workshops about what is going on in freight transport with a view to finding out what trends and new knowledge and modelling needs there were. And it very rapidly became clear that digitalisation was a fundamental part of this. We identified, and this is not probably not news to you, two main areas digitalization and decarbonization or climate change as the two things which were worry, worrying and engaging the logistics industry. On the other hand, with those two things, there are in just in recent years, there have been a couple of very, very big events that have changed the way people look at logistics and um, transport. One of those was COVID which had um, some two, two significant impacts at least. One was an acceleration of home office and home um, and internet shopping. 
but also um, one thing that we found out was it also caused a rapid increase in the provision of chilled fast logistics. Next slide, please. The um, the other aspect which um, when we did the survey hadn't happened yet was the war in Ukraine, which has brought to the fore a concern on security of transportation systems and questions around globalization. So going back to digitalization and the environment, though, uh, there are various aspects of these these two big themes which are that stand out particularly in terms of the environment. And I think this is very important for the logistics industry. There is now there are now signs that customers are willing to pay more for decarbonisation. You talk to most people in the logistics industry; it's a very cost-oriented industry, very competitive, and they will say, "Ah, oh, no, we can't do anything about the environment because it's going to cost us money," and it will. But there are examples that you can give, which I won't go into now. There's one mentioned on a couple of mentioned on this slide, where there is evidence that customers are willing to pay more for more sustainability. What are the knowledge needs? Uh, next, yeah, next slide, please. Um, no, one before that. No, the one before that. That's this one, thank you. No, one after that. That's the one. So overall, the knowledge and analysis needs for the environment um, raise a series of questions. Um, the main questions are how can you um, accelerate the transition or transformation of the ecosystem or innovation system in logistics towards zero carbon logistics? What are the business cases? How can you induce modal shifts, which, uh, which is a topic that the EU has been struggling with, I would argue, for many years. How do you get behaviour to change? Those are two main uh, areas, I think, which require new research and new understanding. Next slide, please. In terms of digitalization, um, from my perspective, working in an innovation, innovation institute that considers life through the spectacles of systems analysis, it is clear to us that digitalization implies system change in logistics. Um, I've mentioned some examples here, but in um, online retail, for example, the fact that Ocado, a on-round retailer, is the biggest retailer in the UK, even in Tesco's, the supermarket chain. Um, there are things like cloud-based open markets and blockchain methods and for automated contracts, which offer the prospect of restructuring logistics. Next slide, please. There are also ideas that have been around for quite a long time, actually, around what are the potential for the Internet of Things and the combination of smart devices in the field of logistics. Um, one of the most um, uh, visionary examples in in the literature is the idea of uh, the physical Internet, a combination of synchromodality where logistics operations are organized through op real time optimization. And as conditions change in real time, you decide which mode you're going to go from the next from the next junction or the next interchange, combined with a system in the physical internet of standardized but differing sizes of container boxes, not just the standard container. Um, the idea is also implicit here that you can reduce warehousing, that you use vehicles as mobile warehouses effectively to reduce your warehousing costs. Next slide, next slide please. We've talked about a little bit about COVID changes already, um, online retail and home delivered deliveries, but also how you make systems resilient to these unexpected events, which were always a possibility in the past. But now we know that they've got an example that they've happened, that all of a sudden all these computer chips from China aren't necessarily going to arrive on time and certainly not just in time. So where are your silicon chips going to come from? That's changing the way logistics is viewed and the supply, nature of supply chains. Next um, slide, please. And this is my final slide, actually. Uh, what is really missing in the understanding of how logistics is changing is not 
whether there is de digitalization happening or not, we've heard a lot about that this afternoon. Not whether there is decarbonisation or ideas about decarbonisation. That is a trend that is, <clears throat> that is at least understood as a possibility. And there is a lot of research and technical knowledge and policy action about decarbonising vehicles in particular. But the connection between digital technologies and decarbonisation is still very poorly understood. Um, there is a new buzzword that I've come across in recent weeks, um, the idea of a twin transition or a twin transformation, which means transition, transformation in dig through digitalization in, for example, decarbonisation. But there is actually very little understanding of what's going on in these terms, the, the connection between the two. There is a lot of work, a lot of detail work in digitalization big literature, mathematical literatures, operational literatures, technology, etc. There is a lot of work about decarbonisation technologies, though neither of these two areas are particularly um, decided or certain yet. But how do digital technologies impact on decarbonisation? If you want a very low carbon transport system, you're going to have to have new fuels, new technologies. But where does digitalization affect that? Does it make it more possible? Does digitalization with more home shopping make it more difficult because of an increasing demand or a requirement for reduced um, delivery times? These are questions that I think are still pretty open and require further research. They, and this is my last point, they lead to, in our research and storm, two big sets of questions. Firstly, how can policy try and steer the impacts of digitalization and the technological developments in digitalization to support decarbonization? That's the one thing. And at the more analytical level, how can policies for digitalization and carbon decarbonization be assessed? The EU puts a great weight on modeling policy change but the current policy models in logistics and freight transport don't really address digitalization at all. So we need new models. Thanks very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, and uh, <clears throat> very interesting and fine points. And also thank you for bringing up uh, the the point on physical internet and synchromodality. I recall a lot of discussion with discussions that we had within the uh, storm project. Thank you so much. Uh, I think now it's uh, time to have our Q and A. Uh, I would suggest, if of course. Uh, uh, Lisa permits this for all our panelists to switch on their cameras so we get a more realistic, uh, let's say, view, uh, sense that, of a panel. Yes? That sounds like a great idea. Thank you, dearest. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we heard uh, with interest a lot of great points in your presentations and of course this generate questions so may i address where's my friend wasim he has not switched his camera on if he can it would be fantastic thank you because my first question goes to you why do we need individual modeling of freight vehicles in new freight transport applications wasim Yes, uh, so uh, we've mentioned how uh, now we have complex structures and we need to uh, monitor individual behaviors now and they are complex. Uh, aggregate aggregate now information are less valuable than it used to be. And uh, we need to model such individual uh, individual behaviors with the help of big data. Um, such complexity uh, now is needed when we try to, uh, for example, reflect that in our planning. Now, and now, I'm, and now I'm taking the charging infrastructure planning as an example because we have uh, already studied cases working on this uh, on this application. Now, traditional modeling is not 
really helpful to us like it used to be. Uh, we are now trying to model different actors and different vehicles with different technologies. These vehicles or these technologies have their own limitations, different limitations, and even each technology could be uh, could be equipped with different or could have different equipments that could impact also or could change its 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 uh, behavior with the infrastructure. Now, this is from the vehicle side, from the infrastructure side. Also, it with with every type of infrastructure installed, you have its own limitation, and that system itself is not isolated. It's connected to other systems, so you don't just put, uh, for example, chargers. You now have to consider the power grid, the the electricity generation for these areas, and how we need to develop other systems in order to uh, have. Uh, that system run perfectly or run in, in a good way. So a lot of complex issues, a lot of complex detailed uh, information that now we're gathering from different systems and we need to uh, to consider that or model that with the help of, uh, of big data. So big data help us now identify these heterogeneity and individual behaviors that in, at, the, at, the, at the low level and go up and build up a system and go up and then have a, a nicer or a, a better view of that multi-dimensional, I would say, complex system. Thank you, Asim. A complex uh, issue, very good and concise answer. And Barry, what is the biggest challenge uh, you face for the adoption of the digital consignment node? Um, the biggest concern is it's, it's community. Every party needs to be in a, a part of the community. So it's it's a little bit the, the, the chicken and the egg. Uh, we see shippers that they say, we, we all see the opportunities, but they don't know how to start with it and, and how to, to see it as a project. It's, it's very difficult. It's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's a lot of change management is going on. A lot of people are afraid of their jobs because we, we, we're taking away, we, we need their expertise for doing the things. Um, there are lots of opportunities. So the biggest challenge is put the noses in the same direction and see what has happened because it's a little bit chaos right now. There is no uh, legal acceptance. Some country, country says, okay, we need it. Other can make it mandatory. So for, for companies, for all the stakeholders in logistics, the, the, biggest, advantage, uh, the, the biggest issue uh, for the adoption is all uh, be a part of the community. And that is what we have to do to, to convince them uh, to start with it and not wait to tomorrow, but do it step by step and get be a part of, of one of more communities. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And may I go to Lucy? Uh, what do you find uh, is the biggest challenge, Lucy, uh, in our prep this space for mobility action as it develops? And let us all please, uh, uh, very concise, and thank you for, for doing so up to now, so that we'll, we uh, will all be allowed to answer at least one question. Thank you. Lucy? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges is that, of course, we're looking into a digital infrastructure, but the underlying standardization on the data models and formats is something that's going on in the different subdomains, and it's a much larger problem then deciding on a digital infrastructure, so also mapping these standards and um, trying to also see a way on how to in the future support the convergence of these standards. And we see that there are bigger standards present and we also discussed it yesterday in the mobility domain versus in the logistics domain. Um, it's a little bit more fragmented um, and that's that's still a big issue. Um, and then we also see a big issue with the legal concerns um, on data sharing. We see that there's not necessarily a question of technical infrastructure also, but the, the contract, contractual issues on data sharing, especially cross-border, uh, are one of our main concerns at the moment. And we have a dedicated subgroup looking into this right now. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. And may I go now to, to Gorka? Uh, what type of data supports uh, the 5G Meta platform? Gorka. Okay, so the 5G Meta platform, 
supports different uh, types of data, for instance, image uh, data, also video streams or streaming of video, also vehicular standard HC messages. And then we have also the possibility of sending JSON uh, messages, uh, or JSON data that are text messages following a standard structure. This gives us uh, a lot of flexibility because we can essentially um, code anything in, in a JSON. So any kind of sensor can be, uh, sensor data can be uh, put in a JSON uh, message. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. Thank you, Gorka. Thank you. And Jonathan, what are the low hanging fruits uh, for digitalization, Jonathan? Uh, you are muted, dear friend. Correct. <laughs> well, there had to be one, didn't there? Um, one of the low hanging fruits I think we've already talked about today um, is actually using digital technologies to reduce paperwork with the uh, with the app that you mentioned. Um, according to the interviews we've had, that has a potential to save an awful lot of money in the industry logistics industry, not through just saving of manpower. And as you as you mentioned, allowing, for example, truck drivers of different languages to use just their um, just an application with a translation, but also to automate the process so that you don't have to have to have physical border controls and stop at borders. That's also apparently a big issue. So that's one low hanging fruit. Um, another low hanging fruit, I think, is in particular for institutions like the railways, but also um, for customers, being able to track your goods in real time, internationally reliably. I think that is something that's coming, but isn't fully there yet. In terms of, and the last thing and point I would make here is in terms of um, decarbonisation, in order to decarbonise and have policies, you need to know how much fuel you're using on or how much, how much Im your emissions are. And digital technologies offer the possibility of really cheap sensors that can at least tell you how full your petrol tank is and optimize your journey times and tell you how you and tell you how you're driving. And I think that is also a low hanging fruit where you could save quite a lot of fuel and therefore emissions. Thanks. Thank you very much. I always savor your answers, and uh, I think we have uh, only a few minutes, so I'll address uh, Jost. Jost, uh, why uh, you have made uh, connecting the dots the central, <laughs> let's say, motto for our organization? Well, that's a beauty. How important of is it to you yeah. and to us? Thank you. That's the beauty of receiving unprepared questions, so no worry. But um, <laughs> connecting the dots, that's indeed that we are a public-private partnership. So I'm not a company, I'm not a public institution, I'm actually a creature in the middle. Um, we've been asked by the Commission um, in 1991 already, 1991, to bring innovation in transport and mobility. Now, at that time, it was about telematics, that's also part of our long name, E-R-T-I-C-O. Uh, but today, it is definitely about uh, the physical infrastructure with digital twins uh, for connected and automated driving. It's about logistics, definitely, today. And the e, uh, the e documents, for example, the European program on that is a clear example of that. But also, it is about data. And that's exactly the core of this seminar, of this webinar. And, and data is also something that is intangible, immaterial, but it connects. It connects the sender with the receiver. It can be e-commerce that you buy. It can be a financial transaction. It can also be ordering, I don't know, following, track and tracing a good or a document uh, in the space, literally. Um, and so that's why we think connecting these dots are very worthwhile for Artico. There's no one else doing it really as, as we do. And also we don't do that for profit. We are a not-for-profit organization. We are there for the partners. So we are there for you to bring new talents and new developments. Look at our innovation platforms, uh, data for road safety, uh, traffic management um, platforms, automated valet parking, a self-parking car also needs data sharing and connectivity and et cetera, et cetera. So, Anyway, go on our website, article.com, and come to the Congress. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, dear Jost. And I think uh, this will uh, uh, bring us back to Lisa yeah. to wrap up and close. Uh, Thank, you, Thank you, my panelists, so much for your uh, wonderful presentations, for your time and efforts. Lisa?
Indeed, thank you very much uh, to the panelists. Thank you to Nikos and thank you to my CEO, Just van Tomme. But last but not least, thank you for those who have been uh, tuning in on us today and listening uh, and learning, hopefully, new uh, things. And last but not least, I look forward to seeing you in Portugal. Thank you very much. <laughs>